This video is going to go over work done by the gravitational force. As we have previously discussed, the work done by a force is the parallel component of the force times the distance, or it's often written as F d cosine theta. For the gravitational force, for something that's moving upwards a distance d, the work done by gravity is the gravitational force mg times the distance that it moves d times the cosine of the angle between the force and the motion. Here, the force of gravity is straight down, the motion is straight up, so the angle between the force and the displacement vector is 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. Another way of remembering this is that if a force is acting in the opposite direction that the object is moving, that force is going to do negative work. So putting these together, the work done by the force of gravity is going to be negative mg times the vertical distance d as something is moving upwards. Again, as something is moving up where the force is against the motion, the work done will be negative. And we're going to see later on that this work done by gravity is going to be related to gravitational potential energy. Um, but right now, all we're looking at is the work done by this gravitational force. As something is starting to move back downward, the force of gravity is downward, the motion is downward, and so in this case, the angle between the force and the displacement is zero degrees, so the cosine of zero degrees is positive one. So the work done for something that's falling straight down is the force of gravity, mg, times the vertical distance, d, times positive one. It, the work done by gravity as something is moving downward is positive mg times the vertical distance. The mass times 9.8 meters per second squared if we're on Earth or whatever g is on whatever planet you're looking at, times the vertical distance that the object travels. Again, work is the parallel component of the force times the distance. Here, all of the force of gravity, all of the weight, mg, is parallel to the motion. So the work done is positive mg times the vertical distance. And it turns out that these two equations will be true for objects that are not moving straight up or straight down, as long as the d that we're talking about in that equation is still the vertical distance traveled, how far it moves in the vertical direction, the vertical component of the displacement. To see how that works, let's look at an object on an incline. Here we have an object of mass m. It's sliding down this incline. It slides a distance l along the incline. The incline is tilted at an angle theta, and the vertical distance is d. And so one of the ways that we can find work is to look at the component of the force that's parallel to the motion. Here, that would be the parallel component of the weight, mg sine theta. So the work done by gravity would be the parallel component of the force times the displacement, which would be mg sine theta times the distance along the ramp l. But, looking at this ramp, sine of theta is the opposite side over the adjacent side. The sine of theta is that vertical height of the ramp d over the hypotenuse l. So in the equation, we can replace sine theta with d over l, or we, we, we can rearrange that so that l equals d over sine theta. And so substituting that in, we have mg sine theta times d over sine theta which gives us the same equation that we had before. We have mg times the vertical distance. So if something is sliding down the ramp, the work done by gravity is positive mg times the vertical distance. And if something was sliding up the ramp, it would be just like the case that we had before. It would be negative mg times the vertical distance. And it turns out that this can even be applied in situations where the ramp would change angles in the middle. Uh, assuming that the object is able to continuously slide along here, so we're not going to worry about the that little corner and it might cause the, the box to um, tip over. But if I have something that's sliding down this ramp, so it's moving a vertical distance d1 in the first part, it's moving a vertical distance d2 in the second part, to look at the total work done as it slides down this ramp, I could break it up into those two pieces. So the work done over the first piece would be mg times d1. The work done over the second piece would be mg times d2. 
So the total work done would be mg times d1 plus mg times d2, the two works added together. Factoring out the mg, I have mg times the quantity, d1 plus d2, which can be written as mg times the vertical distance d. Again, even though the ramp changed angle in the middle, the work done by gravity as it slid down this more complicated ramp is still just mg times the vertical distance d. And again, this could be extended to a ramp that had three pieces, where the work done or the first piece was mg d1, the work done over the second piece was mg d2, the work done over the third piece would be mg d3, and so the total work done is mg times d1 plus d2 plus d3, which still is mg times the vertical distance d. So no matter how many pieces I break this up into, the work done is still going to be mg times the vertical distance d. And if we take this idea and we extend it so that we have an infinite number of little pieces, which basically turns this ramp into a curved shape, the work done by the force of gravity would still be mg times the vertical distance d. The fact that it's on this curved surface is not going to affect things. The work done by gravity only depends on that vertical distance that it travels. When we talked about work, we said that another way of interpreting work was that it was the force times the parallel component of the displacement. Here, if, some, if we're looking at the force of gravity, the force of gravity is always straight down. So the work done is going to be how far it moves in that up and down direction, that vertical distance that it moves. The work done by the force of gravity is mg times the vertical distance d. This allows us to do problems that we couldn't do with kinematics. When we had just a flat ramp, we were able to break the force into components, we could calculate the acceleration, and if we wanted to know the speed at the bottom of the ramp, we could use kinematics because the acceleration was constant. With a curved ramp, the acceleration is not constant. The acceleration is changing the entire time. So using the kinematic equations that only work for constant acceleration would not work here. But looking at this from the work and energy point of view, it is exactly the same to calculate the work done on a curved ramp as it is looking at the work done as something slides down a normal straight incline. So I have these two different ramps. One is tilted at 15 degrees and it's at a height of 10 meters. And I have a 10 kilogram box on top starting from rest. The second ramp is tilted at 80 degrees. I have the box also starting at a height of 10 meters and it's a one kilogram box starting from rest. And I wanna look at which box is moving faster when it reaches the bottom of the ramp. And I'm going to look at this from the work and energy point of view. In both cases, the only work that's being done is work done by the force of gravity. The normal force acting on this box, the work done is zero. The normal force is perpendicular to the motion. So as it slides down the ramp, the only work that's being done is due to the force of gravity. So the work done on box A is M1, which would be 10 kilograms times G times D. The work done on um, the one kilogram box would be one kilogram times G times D. In both of those cases, the work done by gravity is the net work done. The net work done is the change in kinetic energy of the box. So for the first box, that net work done, M1 times G times D, equals the change in kinetic energy. It's the final kinetic energy, 1 half times M1 times the final speed squared, minus the initial kinetic energy. Since this box is starting from rest, the initial kinetic energy is zero. For the second box, it would be the same thing. M2 times G times D equals the final kinetic energy, 1 half M2 V squared minus the initial kinetic energy of zero. And the reason that I wrote the, both of these in terms of the mass without plugging the mass in is to show that the mass actually divides out. In the first case, the mass divides out. In the second case, M2 divides out. And so in both cases, if we solve for the speed, we have that the speed equals the square root of two times g times d. Both of those boxes would have the exact same speed at the bottom of the ramp. It doesn't matter that one was 10 kilograms, one was one kilogram. The work done will depend on the mass, but the speed at the bottom will not depend on the mass. It's just like if we're looking at dropping two objects and looking at free fall, 
the speed that they have when they've traveled a certain distance down, as long as we're ignoring air resistance, has nothing to do with the masses of the different objects. The, a larger mass would have a larger force of gravity, but it has more inertia, so when you divide the force by the mass, you still get the same acceleration. It's the same thing here. The kinetic energy depends on the mass, and so having a mass that's 10 times as big will cause 10 times the work, but in the kinetic energy equation, you also have 10 times the mass, and so in the end, that mass divides out, and you get that the speeds are the same. If they both started from rest, and they both traveled the same vertical distance, 10 meters, then they both have the same speed at the bottom. And so now looking at a numerical version of this same situation, let's look at this 50 kilogram child that pushes off at the top of a slide and gives himself a speed of 10 meters per second at the top of the slide. And this child is sliding along this ramp where there's absolutely zero friction. And we want to find the speed of the child at the bottom of the slide. And the vertical distance of the slide is 30 meters. Again, notice that this is a problem that we cannot do using kinematics. We, this is not a constant acceleration. As this slide curves, the acceleration keeps changing, but we can look at this from work and energy. The first thing we can look at is we can look at the work done by the force of gravity. The work done by the force of gravity is positive because the force of gravity is downward, he's moving downward, and it's mg times the vertical distance d, 50 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times the vertical distance of 30 meters. So the work done by gravity is positive 14,700 joules, 50 times 9.8 times 30. The only other force that's acting on this child as he slides down, again, there's no friction, is the normal force. But here, the normal force is perpendicular to the motion. As he slides down the slide, the normal force is always perpendicular to the direction he's moving. He's moving parallel to the slide, the normal force is perpendicular to the slide, perpendicular to the direction he's moving, so the work done by the normal force is zero the entire time. And so the net work done, which is the work done by gravity, plus the work done by the normal force, ends up being the work done by gravity. And the net work done equals the change in kinetic energy. So the net work done, 14,700 joules, equals the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Here's where you have to be careful. This did not start from rest. The initial kinetic energy is not zero. So the change in kinetic energy, 14,700 joules, equals the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. The initial kinetic energy is 1 half times 50 kilograms times 10 meters per second quantity squared. That initial kinetic energy is 2,500 joules. So we started with 2,500 joules, gravity added 14,700 joules to that kinetic energy, and so the final kinetic energy is 17,200 joules. Again, the work done is the way that we add energy to or take energy from an object. It had 2,500 joules of energy, we added 14,700 joules, so now we have 17,200 joules of kinetic energy. And since we want the speed, we can relate this kinetic energy to the speed. Kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, so 17,200 joules equals 1 half times 50 kilograms times v squared, so the speed at the bottom of the slide is 26.23 meters per second. Again, note that because this child did not start from rest, we had to make sure that we included that initial kinetic energy. If we would have had him start from rest, so the final kinetic energy is just 14,700 joules, you would get 24.25 meters per second. That's what the speed is if he started from rest. Notice the fact that he started at 10 meters per second at the beginning does not mean that he's going 10 meters per second faster when he reaches the end. Starting from rest, he has a speed of 24.25 meters per second. Starting with a speed of 10 meters per second, he has a speed of 26.23 meters per second. So a mistake that some people make is they find the speed, realize that they forgot to include the initial kinetic energy, and then they just try and add the initial speed on to their final speed. That does not work that way. You have to include this in, in the kinetic energy, include the initial kinetic energy, find the work done, and use that to get the final speed.